Okay, <coughs> hello everyone. Um, my name is Francesco and I've been working with uh, Syncorp Italiana for uh, almost 10 years now, former APL Italiana. And uh, I, most of uh, these years I've been working as a programmer and most of my time I work on the ALM module of SOFIA. So let's see what uh, ALM is. ALM stands for Asset and Liability Management or Matching and um, <coughs> it means that uh, you want to try to forecast what is going to happen to your uh, portfolio of both assets and liabilities over the next few years in the future. Um, assets meaning what uh, you own and liabilities meaning what you owe to someone else. Uh, if we talk about insurance companies that are our, our main customers, it means financial instruments uh, you have bought and uh, policies you have sold to the policyholders. So it was born in the late 90s um, because the Italian regulator uh, asked all insurance companies to um, show that their portfolios were well equipped to sustain payments to the policyholders. This because uh, a lot of policies had been sold with a high gar guaranteed rate of return on the investment and uh, market rates were expected to drop suddenly because of the advent of the euro currency. Uh, <coughs> so in recent times, uh, the asset and liability management uh, has become more popular due to European regulations such as the Solvents Capital Requirement and uh, the uh, IFRS 17, the new accounting standards for liabilities. For example, the SCR um, involves uh, a lot of ALM forecasts over a set of uh, market uh, scenarios uh, stressed. So, let's see <coughs> what it is. You have a starting uh, date today and you have a future of a few years uh, and you decide a time interval for um, doing your calculation step by step. For each of the these uh, time intervals um, you have a starting situation so you probably have market values and book values of all your holdings then you read the transactions from your database, perhaps putting in estimations uh, concerning uh, future uncertain cash flows such as variable coupons and uh, dividends, and then you're able to calculate <coughs> the final, the end of date, uh, the end of period uh, situation for all your uh, holdings. So again, market values, book values, a lot of other fields relating to the end of period, but also a lot of fields related to the whole length of the period. For example, the total P&L, the average capital, and the um, money-weighted rate of return, which is the purpose of all this game. If you then aggregate and sum up your, all uh, your results, you get exactly what the, regula the regulator asks for, so uh, a synthetic view of uh, the evolution of your portfolio over the next few months, years, and so. Including the, what we call certified rate, which is the portfolio money-weighted rate of return that is, is exactly the purpose of this. So, if we try to translate this into a quite uh, uh, simple scheme, we get something like this. In the following slides, um, I have no ambition for these schemes to be a um, formal, impeccable description of the process, just to give you an idea of the complexity. So, boxes will be some, uh, somehow parts of the process, steps of the calculation, or uh, parts of the code, and uh, the arrows will represent that some information is passing along from one box to another. So, moving step by step towards the real thing, we have the fair price engine that makes the estimations I was talking about before and affects the behavior of the transactions and of the position calculation with cash flows and prices. Then, you may want to act on the market in response to uh, the evolution of your portfolio. The typical situation is that you have bonds, shares and cash and bonds will eventually uh, expire and become cash at some point. 
So you don't want to end up with a portfolio of only shares and cash, so you probably want to buy something new in the future. If you bring in the liabilities, you get a loop like this, where the rebalancing is affected by the liabilities cash flows. For example, you may have to sell some of your assets to cover payments to the policyholders, and the portfolio yield affects the liabilities at later stages because the, the policies are revaluated based on this portfolio yield. But let's make another step towards the real thing. You have a lot of, de of the dependencies of all these parts of the process by user input, parameters, other stuff. Of course, I won't go into detail. I'm just going to highlight and stress what are the arrows coming in the rebalancing box. So the target asset allocation means that uh, you have a way to give the rebalancing uh, a set of rules uh, so that the rebalancing knows uh, how to decide what to buy and what to sell. So for example, you assign a class to all of your holdings and you get a classification and you tell the rebalancing that you want your classes to have certain weights on the, on the whole portfolio over the next few years. But we cannot pretend that all this scheme has been built uh, as a standalone thing. Uh, it has been developed over the years uh, inside a real uh, system, Sophia in this case. So I highlighted in red uh, four boxes that represent the main archives, the main uh, uh, databases that are in Sophia. Uh, and if we draw the connections between these boxes and these databases, we get a pretty messy scheme. Meaning that at all stages of the process, you are uh, reading over and over things from these databases. Your process is deeply embedded and entangled in the system it has been developed for. <coughs> and when I looked at this slide, I, since I'm a father of two children and I watch animated movies over and over with them, I have to watch, have to watch these movies with them, I couldn't help but remember of a character from Finding Dory, <laughs> Hank the Pope. And Hank, uh, in fact, uh, means, uh, I discovered it, it lately, that it means uh, something like a tangle of ropes. So it is exactly the point I was trying to make. So moving on, um, the new adventure. A uh, couple of years ago, as you all may know by now, uh, APL it Italiana was uh, acquired by Simcorp and became Simcorp Italiana. At that time, Simcorp was already aiming to build its own ALM module on Dimension. But Sofia was now in the house, so uh, why wasting a lot of years of experience and some knowledge acquired over the years uh, exactly on the ALM module? Um, after a few meetings, between uh, us, programmers, and uh, uh, some of the people from the product development in Dimension, it was finally decided to try and go for the, the real thing, the sharing of the code between the two systems. We kind of embraced the green wave and uh, decided to reuse some Sophia code, not to waste it. So this was the game, and the players were um, two scrums in Copenhagen and two scrums in Kiev. Um, so a whole train of developers uh, called the, the Portfolio Analytics and Reporting Train. They have been working uh, over the last 18 months or so with us, not all together at the same time, but uh, some scrums uh, for some time and, uh, and, and so on. Instead, three programmers in Milan were deeply involved since the beginning of the project and up until the later developments. It looked like a winning combination to me. I'm a football fan, a fan of AC Milan, and it kind of looked like a, a golden trio of strikers that helped AC Milan win a Champions League back in 2003. No, but jokes aside, 
um, the cooperation so far has been a very interesting uh, thing aside from the project. This uh, photo was taken in uh, March in Copenhagen uh, w uh, during the planning event we had with the product development uh, team for the uh, performance uh, portfolio analytics and reporting. And uh, more or less, uh, most of the people involved in the project are here in this photo. So, uh, moving on, what was the project about? The most interesting piece of this puzzle or messy scheme for dimension was, in fact, the rebalancing box. So we had to take this box out and make it easy to plug in with another f system, not Sophia. So we had to remove uh, dependencies from uh, other stuff. So before talking about the few bumps along the way, um, let's see what it does. This particular box <coughs> reads what the position calculation has already uh, computed and stored somewhere. Um, it knows, uh, it um, sums up all the cash flows that are falling in the period of the calculation and uh, can, uh, can know the weight of all the holdings in the portfolio so that uh, uh, it can calculate the current asset allocation of the portfolio. Then, based on the rules given to the rebalancing, it knows how to uh, achieve the target asset allocation, buys and selling. And it also has to compute fair prices and cash flows for all the new assets that uh, may uh, be bought during the rebalancing. These new assets bought uh, are not uh, real uh, securities on the market. They are simple, we call them fictitious assets um, of four simple types like fixed coupon bonds, floating rate notes, shares uh, and um, uh, zero coupon bonds that are expected to be found on the market uh, in the future based on the evolution, uh, the expected evolution of the market conditions. And all this stuff is done, of course, uh, uh, for all the future periods in the forecast. So what does it, what it needs to do it is to have somehow the information regarding transaction and holdings stored in a comfortable uh, data structure so that not all the code has to be changed uh, to, to run. Of course, it needs the user input, the classes, the target weights and the information for the fictitious assets. So the securities information about the uh, fictitious assets and the yield curves. So what were the hard things we had to do for this, for extracting the rebalancing box? First one, remove the red links we saw before. Uh, the reading over and over from the databases, the system specific databases we had. For example, du even during the rebalancing, you may have to know what instrument types uh, your uh, assets are. And you cannot direct, make direct calls to something that is SOFIA. So we had to pre-read and store all the information needed, but just, of course, only the one really needed. Otherwise, we would have, have to store a lot of uh, useless stuff. Also, we had to avoid reading and writing files for intermediate results. Uh, this was um, a request by the dimension part of the game. And um, we were deeply relying on that in uh, the current uh, version in Sofia. So we decided to solve this. We had a set of functions that were dealing with this reading and writing uh, compressed files um, for uh, the intermediate results and we converted that with extended the syntax to work with namespaces in the workspace instead of files. So uh, this was uh, uh, an interesting part of the project. And then when you have to somehow making two systems talk to each other, you have to understand what is on the other side, translate it then build a few maps 
between the fields uh, of one system to the fields of the other system, but also adapt because not the two views uh, of the things may differ and you may find uh, uh, two things that you are accustomed to have uh, together, you may find those in the other system in two completely different places. Uh, I don't know, for example, how do you call the market value? Uh, where can I find it? Does it include awkward interest? These were the kind of questions we have had to ask and have answers. And when you are dealing with uh, 20 <laughs> uh, code with 20 year history you and many people that have worked on it over the years, you always find yourself uh, refactoring, uh, trying to improve maintainability, readability and efficiency of the code. For example, you encounter stuff like uh, two things, two similar things that are done in two completely different ways. Or you may find one thing that is done over and over and over with no reason. Or you may find a thing that you expect at a, some stage of the process and you find it in another stage. So uh, when you put your hands in the code to make uh, these big changes, you always find yourself refactoring a lot. But with the pressure of the end user that uh, must not be aware that you're touching the code and altering the behavior. So we programmers tend to be a little overdramatic about our job. Uh, I picture myself uh, on the verge of cutting a wire to defuse a bomb <laughs> when doing this. In this particular die hard scene, the guy says, before cutting the wire, says, no guts, no glory. So. We were brave. So coming to the architecture of the solution. <coughs> um, I will present uh, the, the way the process works, trying to highlight all the phases and what happens. I will not talk about uh, the code that has been written to make this rebalancing box act as a service for dimension because it was written by Stefano, our CTO, and I wouldn't be able to do to explain what happens really under the covers. But I will try to show you what happens. So whenever dimension has finished uh, calculating his um, position results, it sends a request to the rebalancing asking to perform the calculation based on some parameters and give back the result. Among the things that are uh, passed to the rebalancing service are, for example, where to find the position results, where to post the final results of the rebalancing, the dates, some other uh, parameters needed to access the information from the rebalancing side to do the computation. The rebalancing answers back um, instantaneously saying, okay, request received, I'm working, the status is in progress and I'll give you a request ID so that you can ask me later if I'm done or not. So now with the information sent from dimension to the rebalancing, the rebalancing can access the information it needs. The position results are accessed with queries like the one I highlighted there um, that follow an OData protocol. So we have a URL uh, and then uh, some filter and uh, the selection of the fields needed. We get the results back. Uh, this is a sample of the results that is an array of uh, <coughs> objects. Um, where each object is the situation of a holding um, at a specific uh, date along with all the transaction following in the period. Then we can get all the other um, user input and parameters we need with requests similar to the one above. And we get of course uh, some JSON objects or arrays the classification, the um, classes each holding belongs to, the information about the representative securities that are the fictitious as assets I talked before about before. Then the real 
calculation can start, but only after having translated this JSON into that comfortable data structure uh, I said before. So there's a translation part, the computation, and then the results have to be translated back into uh, a format that is readable for a dimension. <coughs> so finally, we produce this JSON um, object containing an array of uh, transactions that have to be made in the future to achieve the target asset allocation. Okay, we get a res um, response that says that the API in dimension has received the, the um, results from the rebalancing and only then we can answer that the job is done. It took uh, less than four seconds. Uh, the status is okay. The results have been sent, posted to the specific link and there's the log. So um, I will try to show you that uh, it, it's, it's really working with a simple, very simple demo. So here is how we um, turn on the service, start the service. Here's a little configuration we need to do uh, so that the service knows how to start. The address uh, is um, localhost, but we can specify a port, um, a path for a log file, the credential to access uh, the position results and uh, to post the results back to dimension and some other stuff that only Stefano knows about. And uh, the, um, the run file is some, something very simple. So um, maybe this is too, too little. Anyway, it's just uh, starting dialogue with a specific workspace. And uh, let's go. This powerful graphic user interface <laughs> tells you that the rebalancing has started. So we go on to the demos. So this is one of the <coughs> example I used to uh, show you the JSON parts before. The only <coughs> change I made was to this is still uh, a little small, but I only replaced uh, the um, API of dimension address with uh, a physical file so that the results are sent to a physical file on my machine. And since I cannot uh, stop uh, the dimension guys right now to work on their service, I cheat, I'm cheating and I'm using uh, Stefano's uh, caching system. So I'm, I will be reading from pre-read stuff from the um, Dimension APIs. So uh, if we open CMD from here and the request will look something like this. So um, we will send a post message to localhost uh, colon port uh, etc. Uh, using here, the content of uh, a JSON file as the body of our post message. So, let's see. Uh, I can you see uh, more or less um, demo one dot JSON. So I'm sending one of the requests we saw before and the answer is uh, a request ID here. If we check the status, yes. we have uh, that it's already done. It's less than two seconds. It's a small example. Now, if we are fast enough, we can also try to see, whoops, we can also try to see here, I open on my browser the same address with the status 
so that I can check the status of the requests that are being sent to the rebalancing service. This is the one we have just uh, computed. If then I run this other example with the demo to JSON that is slightly longer, and if I'm fast enough to go here and press F5, we will see that uh, I'm uh, receiving a, a message that it, the request hasn't been completed yet. I get my request ID uh, somewhere here in the middle and here, and the status is in progress. If I then refresh again, it says done, true, the, the work is done, it took less than five seconds. Uh, this is just, of course, um, the current version. Uh, it's a development version that uh, is, is being uh, installed uh, at the client, uh, at the customer side for uh, the first test right in these months. But it was just to show you an experiment uh, uh, where two system, uh, systems are somehow sharing a part of the code, uh, interfacing it to both systems. We haven't changed uh, the core part of the, um, of the rebalancing box we talked about before. And uh, I believe I'm uh, done. Okay, great. Thank you very much, Francesco.